Well, good morning to you from DAV. We're very pleased to have you join us this morning. My name is John Boerter, and uh, I have the privilege of taking you through the next 45 minutes in order to share some thoughts that I have around Triple B Double E, the pending amendments, and how they interact with the labor law amendments. Now, I have been sitting at NEDLAC for the past six years, and um, clearly have good insight into the spirit and intent underpinning a lot of these amendments. Um, fortunately, I've also had the opportunity to travel internationally to the ILO, and it's given me a lot of confidence because these debates around certain things such as equal pay for work of equal value, the labor broker issue has very much an international flavor to it. And uh, we were able to learn a lot from other countries, especially in the European Union, where a lot of these provisions have already been implemented. However, today we're going to take a look at how you should be positioning yourself as an organization given the context in which we find ourselves. And many people become negative, many people see this as just a bridge too far. But I want to encourage you this morning that it's not what happens to you that matters, but how you interpret what happens to you and how you respond to it. And here's just a wonderful example today of how you can differentiate your organization from a transformation and a human capital point of view, um, whilst many other organizations around you, in fact, are going to take significant strain. Now, on the slide in front of you, in order to, to paint the context to our discussion this morning, we have the points raised by Kasatu in November last year. And they submitted this to NEDLAC as a Section 77 socio-economic protest action submission. In other words, they want to go and stay away around these issues. And they are issues that business, labor, and government are talking about and are big ticket items. Now, these issues have found their way into the National Development Plan. They're finding their way into budget speeches. These issues obviously are also finding their way into labor law and transformation statute. So, for example, the unemployment crisis where we see the unemployed ranks swelling annually by almost half a million just in terms of school leavers, the unemployment issue has found its way into the BE amendments under skills development. And companies that not only train 18.2 learners but employ them will have certain benefits. We look further down at the third bullet point, the income inequality issue, and the link that that has to the Labor Relations Act and the Employment Equity Act around equal pay for work of equal value. Ownership and control of the South African economy has found its way into the triple BEE codes that are being amended to the extent that ownership is being labeled under the amendments as a priority element. And in other words, if a company does not have the minimum ownership credentials, their B verification levels can be diluted by up to two levels. So these are significant issues, colleagues, that will be impacting you in the next 12 to 24 months. Access to quality education also leaving businesses at wit's end as the supply of skills tends to be a challenge. So that is the context in which we are working during today's webinar. I also thought I'd copy and paste the current agenda at NEDLAC. I know many of you don't have access to documentation that is shared there, and this is literally what we're discussing at the moment. You'll notice a number of important issues. Firstly, the four bills that are being amended, the LRA, Equity Acts, BCA, and the Employment Services Bill are no longer at NEDLAC. As you will know, they're with Parliament, and we can expect those four bills to be promulgated as a batch in the fourth quarter. So you still have a few months to get your house in order and to proactively prepare. You have certain issues such as the ILO conventions, the second agenda point where South Africa's Department of Labor are looking at ratifying certain new conventions and possibly delisting others. One convention they will be ratifying is ILO Convention 100 the Equal Pay for Work of Equal Value Convention, which has found its way into those statutes I mentioned. Colleagues, the other big issue, which is quite controversial, is the Wedgie Act. Um, as I said to colleagues earlier, uh, leaving a rather uncomfortable feeling, the Wedgie Bill, 
not because women have to occupy 50% of every forum and, and that type of thing, but simply because the Wedgie Act should have been addressed under the Employment Equity Act, but the Ministry for Women, Children and People with Disabilities have just decided to go it alone. So in future you might find yourself with two different avenues of litigation around gender equality, one under the Equity Act, one under the Gender Equality Bill. Ladies and gentlemen, the other issue of course is youth employment. We met two weeks ago at NEDLAC and uh, we're busy signing an accord between business, labor and government along the lines of driving youth employment and we hope that by April next year, March, April next year, the youth employment subsidy will be in place. Clearly Cosato are opposed to that but we are hoping as business that common sense will prevail and that business will be encouraged to employ people rather than discourage. Now let's move into the reason we're actually having this webinar. The, the issue is triple B double E. And right from the outset, I want to just ask you to reflect on your human resources practices. You know, a lot has been said about gut feel, about companies thumb sucking their employment equity targets, you know, um, just employing people that maybe aren't r uh, the best people for certain positions. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if there's anything that should deter you from doing those types of things, it's the fronting definition. And you'll see in the BE Act, the definition of fronting does not just refer to ownership and other shady deals around fronting. But fronting here refers to any transaction or arrangement across any of the seven BE elements that has a disproportionate flow of benefits, a disproportionate participation percentage, but very importantly that has sustainability concerns. So I think in future we're going to see a lot more litigation under the BE Act around organizations that have got equity uh, plans, have made certain appointments, have entered into enterprise development type arrangements that are purely a front, not sustainable and uh, just to tick a box. And I think that fine of up to 10% of annual turnover or imprisonment or both should be enough to put you off uh, doing that. And if you are concerned about areas in that regard, you need to go and revisit those areas. The BE Act is one of three laws that impose a 10% of annual turnover penalty. The other ones, of course, being the Employment Equity Amendment Bill and the Competitions Commission. Well, what are the big ticket items in the BE amendments? I just want to point three out this morning. The first big ticket item is the introduction of priority elements. I mentioned this earlier that ownership, skills development and enterprise and supply development will probably have the priority status. What that really means, colleagues, is that if you do not meet the minimum targets across those three elements, your verification level will be diluted by two levels. Clearly multinational companies are up in arms about it as are other organizations who might not be meeting the requirements across those three elements. But therein lies the opportunity. You need to regain that ground. You need to leverage the various opportunities such as learnerships, tax breaks, leveraging of enterprise developments and a whole range of other opportunities to regain and recover the ground that might be lost. The other big ticket item here midway down is the, the uh, proposal that skills development spend be doubled from 3% of annual payroll to 6% of annual payroll. That will no doubt have a significant cost implication and it really begs the question right up front and saying, doesn't this demotivate employers from employing employees? Maybe if employers need human capital, they should rather procure the human capital through independent contractor arrangements by bringing in cleaning services, IT firms and security firms and maybe even labor brokers because the simple reality is that as soon as you employ someone, you're incurring a significant amount of hidden costs. The last area I want to point out is the second last bullet point where many organizations 
earned their enterprise development points by paying their suppliers early. That still will apply, but is restricted to no more than 15% of the total claim. So if we take a look at it practically on the scorecard, we see that the seven elements will probably be diluted to five elements. Management control and employment equity, which are currently weighted as 25 points, will probably be reduced to 15. Now you should be thinking to yourself, well isn't that contradictory to what the Department of Labor are trying to drive? Well absolutely it is. They're trying to drive employment equity but the DTR scorecard seems to be kicking against that and rather suggesting that the key focus areas should be preferential procurement and enterprise development which will probably gain an additional 10 points. I think the reason for that shift in emphasis to procurement and ED is simply because small enterprises are seen as the primary vehicles for job creation. So it's a very interesting dynamic that is unfolding here. From the human capital point of view, the question is a simple one. But the answer might be more complex than you think. Every organization needs human capital in order to thrive. There are two ways to bring human capital in. The first one is you employ the human capital, in which case your employment equity and skills development elements become pertinent. The other option is rather than employing individuals and human capital, you bring them in through third party arrangements through preferential procurement and enterprise development. And it might very well be a smart move from a transformation point of view to procure from well transformed organizations. A practical example would be a company down in KZN that I visited three weeks ago. This organization colleagues currently has a 66 points BE verification score, which currently puts them at a level four. If we take a look at the green column and the recalibrated point scores, you will notice that 66 points in the proposed new calibration structure will only put them at level seven. Assuming they do not comply with the priority elements such as ownership, they will be diluted by a further two levels. Can you imagine going from a level four contributor to a non-compliant contributor in one breath? Therefore, the opportunity exists to be proactive and to try and see how you will position yourself by driving the highly weighted elements that you do not score on totally. So it's very, very exciting stuff. I just want to give you one example of the cost impact, ladies and gentlemen, of bringing people onto your payroll rather than outsourcing your human capital needs. There's an organization that currently pays a labor broker 200 million rand a year for their human capital provision. If that 200 million rand, if those fixed term contractors were rather taken on permanently by that organization, their payroll would increase by, say, around 200 million rand. And just on paragraph triple one, skills development spend, to comply with 6% of 200 million rand payroll increase means their operating costs would immediately increase by 12 million rand. The point I'm trying to make is you cannot make decisions that are based on labor law amendments without taking into account the knock-on impact on your triple B double E scorecards. If we take a look at preferential procurement and the pending changes under preferential procurement, you will also notice that there's a shift towards driving procurement spend from local content as well as value adding suppliers. So the whole dynamic is changing and companies have to become a lot more innovative in their BE practices. Being a human resources practitioner, I try to interpret this for myself. And effectively what I did was I said, well, I need to ensure that I have an integrated transformation strategy. And obviously I need a workforce plan or a human capital plan. And not many organizations have this, where you currently are, your as is, and your to be. But the bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, is the following. 
from a transformation point of view, 65 points on your B scorecard are linked to non-employment related elements and only 35 points around employment. So therefore, when you are looking at human capital needs, the very, very important decision is do we employ or do we procure? I did some very basic calculations to compare the cost of employing versus the cost of procuring. And based on a payroll of 100 rand, just for illustrative purposes, I established that all the hidden costs attached to a payroll of 100 rand amount to around 26 rand. In every 100 rand increase in payroll. With the rider that your B level will probably be diluted by one level because I can guarantee you that it's probably more difficult to maintain your management control and employment equity status and your skill status in the new dispensation. Whereas if you procure your skills through an enterprise development and a procurement relationship, then you're looking only at about a 16 Rand cost impact per 100 Rand and your B level is likely to be improved. Now I don't think necessarily that this is a negative thing because if companies do redirect the efforts to more procurement and enterprise development relationships around human capital, then you will be driving new venture creation, enterprise development, and of course, along with that, employment creation. Colleagues, I don't know about you, but sometimes employers and I feel fatigued around the demand on us, on us as private business. And just one little example of the new grant regulations around your skills, levies, and grants. The CETA regulations, which are currently, it appears, a uh, subject to litigation between business and the Minister of Higher Education, you see a further encroachment on our skills grants. For every thousand rand payroll, you pay 1%, which is 10 rand to SARS, and they're very, very effective at collecting that and paying it to the National Skills Fund. Of course, from there, the NSF battle to disperse that money. But the point is, the Qualifications Council for Trades and Occupations takes another five cents because this is a new institution that has been established to drive quality assurance in the CETA environment. That's a new cost, colleagues. The CETA then lands up with seven rand ninety-five, of which one rand goes into its operating costs, which means there are there's six rand ninety-five left in your little bank account of the first ten rand that was paid. The mandatory grant is at present 50%. In other words, 5 Rand. You are guaranteed to get back 5 Rand for submitting a workplace skills plan and an annual training report. Colleagues, that has dropped to 20% or 2 Rand, which means that 4 Rand 95 is now the subject of a big bun fight between business unions and FET colleges as they try and muscle in on the pivotal and discretionary grants. In other words, I think the unintended consequence is going to be that companies are going to start rather training for fit-for-purpose skills than just fitting in to the framework of skills development for the sake of mandatory grants and for the sake of compliance in other areas. Unfortunate, but I think it's a reality. Let's take a look at legal compliance. If we change gears and for a minute look at the labor law amendments, you would probably be aware that the Director General of the Department of Labor indicated that you can expect the four new bills to be finalized in the fourth quarter of this year. Now I don't want you to have a bad night's rest because there will be phase in periods. The fourth bullet point illustrates this. In the amendments currently there's a two-year phase in period before your employers will be able to fire you without going through a disciplinary procedure from a procedural and a substantive viewpoint. Now that will only apply to you if you're a higher earner. In other words, if you, if you earn more than a million rand a year, you could be on the receiving end of a Donald Trump, your fired instruction. However, you still have two years before that would take place from the date of promulgation. 
equal pay for work of equal value and the new fixed term contract dispensations and the new labor broker dispensations will all have some form of transitionary arrangement. It has to be the case or else a lot of existing contracts, both commercial and employment contracts, will not be able to be adhered to. I want to spend a few minutes talking about equal treatment. Having sat on the Employment Equity Commission for three years, I can tell you now that they are busy working with the International Labour Organization and they are currently drafting codes of good practice around equal pay for work of equal value. Colleagues, this is by far the most far-reaching and complex component of the labour law amendments, simply because it leaves you in an uncertain space. Because the Labour Relations Act is depicted on the screen in front of you. And here, the Labour Relations Act only applies the principle of equal pay for work of equal value to fixed term contractors in the yellow space. In other words, vulnerable fixed term contractors who earn below 183,000 Rand per annum and more than six months on a fixed term contract. So the Labor Relations Act wants to ensure that people are treated the same for doing work of the same value if they are vulnerable. They do allow you to pay differentially as long as you can justify that based on seniority, experience, length of service, merit criteria and performance type factors. The point I'm really making is that the LRA only applies that to fixed term contractors through labor brokers or even your own fixed term contractors directly employed by you after six months and below that threshold. Herein lies one of the biggest contradictions in the amendments. Not to be outdone, the Employment Equity Act comes along and the Employment Equity Act also gives the right of equal pay to employees, but here they don't restrict it just to vulnerable employees. They here give everyone, anyone, you'll read subsection 1 says, no person may unfairly discriminate against an employee. So anyone from your unskilled employee right through to your board of directors now has a right to claim discrimination unfairly based on inequitable terms and conditions of employment when comparing one position occupied by one individual to the same position occupied by a different individual. I think we're going to see significant litigation initially around this, but what do you need to do to get your house in order? Well colleagues, what you do need to do is make sure that you have an easy and effective way of determining the value of a position. That really is the starting point. So you either need a very good job grading system, Hay, Patterson, Peromnes, whatever the case may be, and that will give you your broad salary ranges. Alternatively, what you need to do is you need to develop something that works for you. A guideline may be to use the current unit standards and qualifications and OFO codes that you have, and then try and look at aligning your job types to those codes to try and impose broad bands of grading. Once you've done that, you can look at a key performance area, KPI, performance management system, linked to career and succession plans in determining where a person should be pitched in a particular job category in relation to the job bands. If you do not have a basis for determining the value of a job, colleagues, you are going to find yourself on the short end of the stick in respect of this particular provision. Well, what are the fines that you can expect under the Employment Equity Act? Well, I did mention to you earlier that if you're really, really naughty in terms of the Employment Equity Act, then you need to look at the right-hand column if you believe that you've been exceptionally naughty because there it talks about a contravention of any section, it's provision under sections 20 and 21. Now, that talks to your Employment Equity Plan. It poses the question, how did you arrive at your targets per race, gender, 
and disability category. Was there substance attached to that? Was it based on a sort of a scientific and validated basis? Was it based on performance outcomes? Was it based on skills audits? Or did you suck your thumb really hard in arriving at those targets? Secondly, it also talks to the fact that if you do not achieve the targets that you have set, and it's not for a justifiable reason, you will then face between 2 and 10% of annual turnover. Now we did a little exercise before we went to NEDLAC on this issue and we established that 9 of the 10 top JSE listed companies in terms of their market capitalization would be liquidated if they were faced with a 10% of annual turnover fine. The middle column talks to you if you were only just a little bit naughty. Administrative non-compliance where you don't have a proper committee under section 16, it doesn't meet regularly, it's not representative of all the interests, and so on and so forth. So if there's one issue that you need to fix now, you need to attend to immediately, it is this particular issue around the Employment Equity Act. So many people have said to me, John, surely with the new fixed term contract dispensation, after six months, temporary workers on fixed-term contracts become permanent employees. Many people have asked me that same question where they have labor brokers providing them with staff. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not the case. If you read Section 198 of the Labor Relations Act, it is very, very clear. It says that for purposes of the Labor Relations Act, the client becomes the deemed employer after six months. But it doesn't talk about permanent employment, it says the deemed employer. Secondly, if you continue reading that, it says that deemed employment means that the fixed term contractor of the labor broker can choose whether they're going to sue the client or the labor broker severally or jointly. So ladies and gentlemen, joint and several liability now extends to the Labor Relations Act and that's what this slide is trying to reflect. In the past the Labor Relations Act meant that the TES, the Labor Broker, would be off to the CCMA or Labor Court or Bargaining Council for unfair dismissals, unfair labor practices. That now falls in the domain of joint and several liability. But please note that after six months the Labor Broker will remain the employer because the payroll will be still administered by the broker, Skills Levies Act, UIF, Workman's Compensation, those types of payments are still made and administered by the labor broker. The other reason why I say you can still be on a fixed term contract for any length of time is because after 24 months, if a person on a fixed term contract's employment is terminated subsequent to 24 months, they are entitled to what is called termination pay. It's not a retrenchment, it's merely a payment of one week per completed year of service in recognition of the duration of the fixed term contract. So if they were on a fixed term contract for say 10 years in building a harbor that took 10 years to build, after 10 years you wouldn't have to retrench them, you would have to pay them 10 weeks termination pay. Obviously that is a knock-on effect in terms of service level agreements and the costs attached to that. So colleagues, bringing this discussion to a conclusion, I would recommend three things at this point in time. You have got probably eight months, maybe a bit less, to go and reassess your triple BW scorecards against the backdrop of the priority elements and the dilution factor attached to those. You also need to start looking at your human capital requirements and making a strategic decision in respect of what you're going to insource and what you're going to employ because your procurement is a significantly weighted factor. The focus on human capital needs is going to increase significantly. And we would like to offer an opportunity to engage with you if you have any questions around the way forward. Now we're just going to take a look and see 
if there are any questions that you've sent through and I'll try and uh, answer those particular questions. Well, at this point, it appears that there aren't any questions that have come through. And um, maybe just a concluding comment from, from me before we log off is, colleagues, this poses a great opportunity. I see triple BEE as far more important than the labor law amendments. Cost, quality, and customer service is critically important. Every day you can open the business report and you will see that companies are under pressure, their margins are under pressure, and many organizations spend 3% of net profit on enterprise development, 1% on socioeconomic development. But what they should be doing is they should be looking at the operating expenses and looking for partners to, in their supply chain who can deliver on that so that it can be leveraged as both employment equity and an operating need that is fulfilled. Well, we do have one question that was posed. When will the triple B double E amendments come into effect? Well, if the amendments are approved by the year end, next year you will still be verified on the current B codes. Assuming history will be repeated, you will then have another 12 months in which to phase in the, amend in the amendments. So my suggestion and my um, my forecast would be that only in 2015 the new revised B scorecard requirements would apply. But you cannot sit back and wait for that to happen because you have to start looking at how you're going to align yourself. Here's another question. To confirm, will SMEs in the 5 to 35 million rand annual turnover be rated on all seven categories on the B scorecard? Colleagues, currently qualifying small enterprises or companies that have annual turnover between 5 and 35 million rand per annum, currently they can choose four of the seven elements to be verified. And the new amendments to the B codes that will fall away. So qualifying small enterprises will have to be verified against all the elements. Okay, so QSEs are going to have to rearrange they're thinking around triple B double E. The other change while we're talking about QSEs, the current threshold is 35 million rand per annum annual turnover. That will be increased to 50 million rand annual turnover uh, once the codes are amended in order to cater for that. So maybe um, if you are a QSE under 50 million rand, the only benefit for you will not be to be verified on four elements, but what will happen is if you do not meet the three priority elements, you will only be diluted by one level. It's the generic open um, BE companies that will be diluted by two levels. If you are under 5 million Rand, you're currently an exempt micro enterprise. An exempt micro enterprise threshold will increase to 10 million Rand from the current 5 million Rand, and they will automatically get a level 4 rating and if they are majority black um, owned they will be elevated to a level 3 rating. So that's quite exciting if you are a an exempt micro enterprise. Anyway that, that seems to bring us to a close. Thank you very much for joining us at DIV. Uh, John Boer